So I recently started believing in annihilationism, not because it's trendy, but because I honestly feel that after having studied the body of scriptures on hell, annihilationism is the best interpretation of all those scriptures. But what I like to do is look at the best arguments against my position and to see how well I could respond to those arguments. So I have found some of the best arguments against annihilationism on YouTube and I'm going to play a few of those clips and I'm going to respond to them one by one. So to avoid this video being exceedingly long, I'm going to make two videos. This one talks about the silly objections to annihilationism. And in the next video, I'm going to talk about the smart objections. So just to recap for everyone who may not be familiar with the terms, annihilationism means the belief that sinners, when they are thrown in hell, they will not suffer eternal torment, but they will be burned up and cease to exist. So they are annihilated. And the alternative belief is that they will be eternally tormented. And I will refer to that as the traditional belief or the traditionalist belief. There's a growing movement to extinguish hell. Uh, and it's called uh, annihilationism. Okay, so that's what you call a boogeyman fallacy. Where you take your opponent's view and you mischaracterize it. And then you criticize that mischaracterization that you created. So nobody's actually trying to extinguish hell. At least annihilationists are not doing that. Yes, maybe there are some people who think that hell is figurative. But annihilationists believe in a literal hell. But what they believe is that sinners will be uh, annihilated and cease to exist. Nobody is trying to extinguish hell. I think that the uh, theology of annihilationism downplays and discounts the overwhelming and infinite holiness of God. God is infinitely holy and therefore any sin of any degree that diminishes infinite holiness deserves infinite punishment. Okay, so that sounds good, but it's human reasoning. Uh, God is infinitely holy, but unless the Bible teaches that any sin against God deserves infinite punishment, uh, then we have no basis for saying that. That is just human reasoning, human logic. Here are some facts. Jesus was not eternally punished for our sins. He died on the cross and all the punishment for our sins took place within that three hour period during which he died. Right? He did not suffer eternity in hell for our sins. So again, the logic sounds good, but it's not God's reasoning. That is man's reasoning. Okay, we are created beings. That means that there is a time when we did not exist for eternity before that, right? For infinity before that, we did not exist. So that means that the same punishment that all the unrighteous are going to endure of not existing and not being able to be with Christ because they don't exist, every single person has already been through up until we were created. We've all been through eternity of hell. <laughs> All right, so I have no problem with somebody being facetious. I mean, I do it all the time. If you want to be facetious, I mean, I used to make jokes about annihilationism. I used to say, annihilationists don't believe in hell, they believe in heck. Okay, but putting all the jokes aside, again, that is just human reasoning and human logic. And I could give you a simple illustration to show that that reasoning is faulty. Let's suppose there are two people. One of them never visited the United States of America. The other one uh, has been to the US, but he was deported back to his home country. So now both of them are living outside of the United States. Would you say that they're in exactly the same position? No, because one of them has a sentence of deportation permanently over his record. The other one still has hope of visiting the United States one day. They're not exactly in the same position. The person who goes to hell has that sentence of judgment, punishment, rejection, removal from the presence of God permanently over them. The person who's never been created has nothing, they're neutral. So it's not exactly the same thing. First of all, God made us in his image, which is an eternal being, according to Genesis 1.26. God is eternal and so are we. That is simply not true. 
God did not make us immortal beings or eternal beings. Think about it logically. We were created at a certain point in time. For me, it was 1974. For you, it'll be something else. Before that, we did not exist. If you're an eternal being, you would pre-exist for all eternity past and you will exist for eternity future. Even when God created Adam in the Garden of Eden, Adam was not an immortal being because there was a tree of life. And if Adam had eaten that tree of life, he would have lived forever. So that's the reason why God banished him from the garden, so that he would not eat the tree of life and live forever. So if Adam had only achieved immortality by eating from the tree of life, he did not possess that quality of immortality in and of himself. God alone is immortal. And God may grant, God will grant immortality to those who have eternal life. And similarly, God could grant immortality to those who go to hell so that they will be eternally tormented forever. Or he could simply let them perish, as the Bible says. Psalms 26.9 says, Gather not my soul with sinners. To be gathered, one must still exist. Isaiah 38.17 says, but you have lovingly delivered my soul from the pit of corruption. To be delivered would mean a person would still exist. Isaiah 38, 18 says, those who go down to the pit cannot hope for thy truth. Now this presupposes their existence. You wouldn't say they cannot hope if they didn't exist. Psalms 49, 19 says, they shall never see light. You would have to exist to say they will never see light. Uh, that's a guy called Bill Wise and it takes a little bit of stretching, you know, squinting to see his logic. To never see light, you must exist? Really? Okay, here's the logic. In order to see light, you must exist. In order to never see light, there are three possibilities. One, you could be blind. You could exist and be blind. Two, you could exist and be in a room with no doors and windows. Or three, you could be dead or not existing. Somebody who doesn't exist cannot see light. They will never see light. So I just don't understand his logic. And furthermore, all of those scriptures that he quoted just a while ago, none of them have anything to do with hell. Most likely what he did was a concordant search of the word hell in the King James Bible and he came up with all of these Old Testament references to hell. But here's the thing, in the Old Testament, every theologian knows that the Old Testament mistranslates the, the Hebrew word Sheol. It always translates it as hell in the King James Old Testament, but that word Sheol means grave the place of the departed. So one of the scriptures that he quoted was Hezekiah, Isaiah chapter 38. When Hezekiah, God told him, you will die, you will not live. But then he cried and he repented and God added 15 more years. So now he's praising God and he is saying, hell cannot thank you. That is in the King James, but it should really be read, Sheol cannot thank you. Death cannot praise you. Those who go down to the pit cannot hope for your truth. So uh, Bill Wise, is is I, I don't know what's going on in his head logic is obviously not his thing he is saying that those who go down to the pit cannot hope for your truth so the fact that they cannot hope means they exist and that's the opposite of what hezekiah is saying he is saying that if i go down to the pit i could no longer hope why because the pit is not hell the pit is the grave when i'm dead i cannot hope anymore when i'm dead i cannot praise you when I'm dead, I cannot offer thanksgiving to you. That's what this scripture is saying. It's not even talking about hell. Another proof verse is in 2 Thessalonians 1, 8, 9, where it says, Them that obey not the gospel shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord. The destruction is everlasting or the ruination of the person. And in addition, they are from the presence of the Lord. A person has to exist to be from or away from someone. Okay, so once again, that uh, foolish logic showing up in his teachings. He's saying that to be away from someone, you have to exist. All right, now let's say I have this phone. This phone is with me. This phone exists. But if I take this phone and move it away from me, 
and I put it somewhere there. Now it's away from me. So it presently exists and it's away from me. Now if somebody else takes that phone, burns it up in fire, it ceases to exist. But is it not still away from me? While it is being removed from me, it exists. But once it has been removed, whether it continues to exist or ceases to exist, it is still true that it has been removed from me and it is away from me. Similarly, sinners will, be, will suffer eternal destruction away from the presence of God. So that doesn't state whether they continue to exist away from God or they cease to exist away from God. All it says is that they were in the presence of God for judgment. They were removed from the presence of God. And what happens after that, this scripture doesn't really say, except that they suffer eternal destruction. Jesus said in Matthew 23, 15, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. To be a child of hell, a person has to still exist and be in hell. All right, you know I'm not gonna let that one go, right? He's quoting from Matthew 23, 15, where Jesus told the Pharisees, you travel land and sea to make a proselyte, and when you've made it, that does a convert to Judaism, when you've made him, you convert him to twice a child of hell as yourself. And Bill Wise says, he's talking about people who exist and people who are in hell. Jesus, the people that Jesus was speaking to, not only were they not in hell, they weren't even dead. He was speaking to people who were still alive and he was referring to them as children of hell or a child of hell. Clearly not a literal expression, it was a figure of speech to denote how evil and corrupt they were. A child could understand that. You would get the impression that Bill Wise never read the Bible in his entire life. So logic is not his thing. Scripture is not his thing. Maybe he tells a really good joke. His claim to fame is that he got a vision or whatever you want to call it of hell. And his brand is 23 minutes in hell. So of course he sold a book and it's probably a bestseller because Christians love rubbish. And his, that's his claim to fame that during the 23 minutes he spent in hell, he didn't see anybody annihilated. So annihilation, annihilationism can't be true also. His, where he's coming from, he is not trying to defend a theology or a tradition. He's trying to defend his brand, his business. It is very clear. It just takes 10 minutes of listening to that guy to realize he doesn't know anything about the Bible. The way he handles scripture leaves so much to be desired. I wonder if he ever read the Bible in his life. Now, Jesus said it so clearly in Matthew 25, 46. He said, these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into everlasting life. The word everlasting is the same word Ionios. Now, since heaven is everlasting, then so is hell everlasting. Okay, so surprise, surprise. Bill Wise actually gets a scripture right. He is correct. Eternal never means temporary, right? There's some annihilationists I believe Seventh-day Adventists typically and Jehovah's Witnesses who believe that when the Bible uses expressions like forever and ever, it is not talking about an infinite duration but a finite duration. But that is not correct because the expression forever and ever describes the reign of Christ, it describes our reign with Christ, and it describes people in hell. So forever means forever. But I should point out though, that the scripture he just read does not contradict the doctrine of annihilationism because that scripture says sinners will go into everlasting punishment. The punishment is everlasting, but what is that punishment? Uh, that scripture doesn't say that the punishment is eternal torment in fire. The punishment is separation from God, eternal destruction, death, perishing. So just to note, Annihilationism does not contradict that verse of scripture. Why are there several verses about the degrees of punishment in hell, such as Matthew 23, 14, Matthew 10, 15, Luke 12, 46 and 47, and Hebrews 10, 28? How can you have a worse punishment and degrees of annihilationism? How can you be beaten with many stripes or beaten with few at the same time as being wiped from existence or annihilated, as they say? If there is no hell, then there would be no justice served on the murderers, child abusers, and the Hitlers of the world. Would that be fair and just? 
All right, so he's talking about scriptures that seem to teach there will be degrees of punishment in hell. And he quoted from a parable where Jesus said, uh, those who know to do well and don't do it will be beaten with many stripes, and those who don't know to do well will be beaten with many, with few stripes, okay? So, uh, it is debatable whether that is actually teaching degrees of punishment in hell, but for the purposes of this discussion, I will just go along with it. Let's suppose that there are degrees of punishment in hell. That is not only a problem for the annihilationists, that is also a problem for the people who believe in eternal torment. He used the example of Hitler. Let's call two names. Let's compare Hitler with Gandhi. They are both non-Christians, as much as it loads us to think that both of them will be in hell. Now, according to annihilation, both of them will be annihilated in hell. According to eternal torment, both of them will be tormented for all eternity in hell. So the questions that he is asking, how could there be degrees of torment, degrees of punishment in hell, is a problem for both of us. It's a problem for the annihilationists because they're both equally annihilated. But it's also a problem for the person who believe in, it, in eternal torment because they are both equally tormented in fire. What are you going to say? Are you going to say some of them are tormented in a big fire and a small fire? Is there a hot fire and a cold fire? No. If you've ever burned your finger on a stove, you understand how excruciating that pain could be. Whether you are burned with a hot pot on the stove, whether you are burned with hot coals, a small fire, a big fire, it makes absolutely no difference. The pain is going to be excruciating no matter what. Any difference between them is going to be so negligible that the person experiencing that torment will not be able to distinguish. So he said, if Hitler is annihilated, where is the justice? Here's the irony. When annihilationists ask questions like, how could a loving God allow people to be eternally tormented in hell? They say, who are you to impose your justice system in God? When annihilationists say, that is a, not a just form of punishment, that is unjust. They say, who are you to question God's justice? No, he is saying, if Hitler is, is annihilated, where is the justice in that? Isn't he imposing his justice system on the word of God and the discussion? The word of God is what it is. It says what it says. And if the word of God says people will be eternally tormented in hell, that's what it is. And if the word of God says people will be destroyed, they will perish, then don't read anything more into it than that. That it is what it is. So both annihilationists and eternal tormentors have a problem explaining how there will be degrees of punishment in hell. But there are some annihilationists who believe that people will be tormented in, in fire for a period of time and then cease to exist. So maybe those annihilationists could say, well, the big sinners like Hitler will be tormented for a long time and the smaller sinners like Gandhi will be tormented for a shorter period of time. At least they have some explanation for the degrees of punishment in hell. And all of that presupposes that those scriptures that talk about many stripes and few stripes are actually talking about punishment in hell. I'll do another video on that sometime soon. Okay, so what I did today was just present some of the silly arguments against annihilationism and my response to them. And remember, I'm not trying to convince you of my position, all right? It took me 25 years to make that transition from traditionalism to annihilationism. You're not going to make that transition by watching one video. At least appreciate the debate. Appreciate that there are different arguments, there are counter arguments, there are different interpretations of scripture. Right, so in this video, I looked at the silly objections and in my next video, I will look at some smart objections to annihilationism and my response to them. And depending on when you're looking at this video, that video may already be on your screen. So feel free to check that out. So thank you so much for watching. God bless you and I will see you all next time.